As world fairs had in the past, the fair in 1964 provided a timely glimpse of the planet's current realities and future expectations. The New York Times described it as a glittering mirror of our national opulence. It seemed to portend a future where the biggest worry for average Americans would be how to spend their leisure time. I just took it for granted that I, you know, I'd always have a roof over my head and enough to eat. The thought that I'd have to worry about where my next meal was coming from, these thoughts just didn't occur to me. But of course, part of the reason we could think that way is that we took prosperity more or less for granted. In his speech at the World's Fair, President Lyndon Johnson touted a world of prosperity. But that people, people, they shall have the best. All of these dreams. Only to find himself interrupted in mid-speech by demonstrators who felt themselves frozen out of the world. Despite a lengthy struggle, millions of black Americans still did not share in the nation's prosperity or enjoy the full rights of their citizenship. In 1964, many expected that such inequities would soon be addressed. We thought that essentially the material problems of the world had been solved and that the important thing now was to solve the moral problems. There was a society that had to be changed, and it was not going to be changed unless some people decided that they would dedicate their lives to changing it. It was not going to change spontaneously. The World's Fair that year was held in Flushing Meadows, New York. It was supposed to promote the culture and customs of people everywhere, in keeping with its theme of peace through understanding. But it would not be long before Americans would be driven apart by societal disagreements within their own borders and a terrible, costly war on the other side of the globe. The country was not about to experience much of either peace or understanding. In the mid-1960s, the determination to challenge traditional boundaries seemed to be growing in almost every arena. Perhaps most striking was a broadening struggle for civil rights, a struggle that many whites now joined in large numbers. In the summer of 1964, hundreds of college students, white and black, headed south to Mississippi, where many blacks were still mired in a Jim Crow world of poverty and political impotence. These students from the North hoped to register black voters and establish so-called freedom schools to teach literacy skills to those who'd been denied them. They were traveling into a world where many people were set in their ways. President Lyndon Johnson warned the students that the federal government could not guarantee their safety. They received a lot of training to, in order to prepare them for life in Mississippi, which was not going to be very easy. It wasn't easy for us, and we tried to make that very clear to people. I mean, our lives are, on, you know, are in imminent danger every, every minute of the day. When we crossed the line into Mississippi, and it said, Mississippi welcomes you, it was the first time I felt really afraid. In the first group to arrive in Mississippi were students Andrew Goodman, Michael Schwerner, and James Cheney. Within days, all three of them were missing. Bob Moses, who was the head of the Mississippi Summer Project, brought the group together, told us that they were missing, and it was clear to all of us that it was extremely likely that they were dead. Just, just put your feet up in here, walk 
Six weeks after their disappearance, the three were discovered buried in an earthen dam, shot in the head. In that summer of 1964, the Ku Klux Klan was still trying to stop the forces of change. But among the students and in the homes and churches of the black community, the feeling grew stronger that change could not be prevented. We went up to the home of a very poor black woman, sharecropper shack. She had a bunch of kids. She came to the door. She looked at her feet. She said, yes, I'm no to everything we said. And we tried to persuade her to sign this. And it was very clear she signed it. She might get thrown out of her home. After a few minutes of talking, she suddenly straightened up, looked us in the eyes, and said, I'll sign it. And she signed it. That's how powerful the movement was. And the movement expanded to other causes at the end of the so-called Freedom Summer. The First Amendment didn't apply to any campuses in the country. You, you couldn't give a speech without getting it cleared by the administration. When Freedom Summer veterans at the University of California at Berkeley tried to recruit others to their cause, they were barred by university regents. It just set off this explosion among the students and people who had never had a political thought in their, their head just got fired by the idea that someone couldn't tell them when and where to say what they wanted to say. United by what they saw as an injustice, thousands of students began a series of protests that lasted eight weeks. When college officials threatened to expel several of the student leaders, the conflict reached a boiling point. At the time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart that you can't take part, you can't even passively take part. You have to put your body on the wheels and um, we're gonna go in there and we're gonna uh, take over this building. And so when the crowd began to move, I just went with it. First floor is two, second floor is two. Some people looked a little scared because they'd never done anything like that before. I was scared. When the student takeover of a campus building resulted in more than 800 arrests, the university faculty finally weighed in on the side of the demonstrators. Cornered as they were, the regents granted free speech to the students, and thus began an era of confrontation at American universities. In late 1964, another fight was looming for Americans, this one thousands of miles from home, and with far more devastating consequences. For several years, American advisors had been sent to South Vietnam to help prevent what the administration said was a takeover by the communist North. Things were not going well in the South. President Lyndon Johnson decided to dramatically increase the U.S. military commitment to Vietnam. And just as they had throughout history, young Americans answered the call to arms. I didn't want to see my son go, and he promised nothing was going to happen to him, you know, and uh, that it was going to be over very shortly, and he'd be home before I, before I knew it. You grew up watching those John Wayne movies where the good guys always win. I was being John Wayne, I was going to go, and I was going to beat them, and nothing could hurt me. Like many other young men in 1965, Jack Bronson knew very little about war, except that America didn't lose them. This one looked at first to be no exception. The United States, which had defeated Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan and held back the communist Chinese in Korea, now faced a third world army of North Vietnamese soldiers and South Vietnamese Viet Cong guerrillas. American commanders confidently predicted a swift and positive conclusion. I was excited about going to war. The whole battalion was excited about going to war. We were, uh, we were uh, gung-ho.
with 125,000 fresh troops and an armada of helicopters ranging all over South Vietnam, American generals were spoiling for a good fight. They were about to get one. On November the 15th, 1965, Lieutenant Larry Gwynn's unit was helicoptered to a valley in central Vietnam near the Cambodian border. They had gone to intersect the North Vietnamese supply routes to the south. North Vietnamese soldiers watched them arrive. It was my first real hot landing zone. And it was so hot that I had exited my ship, knelt in the grass for about 10 seconds, and a guy pops up next to me whom I knew had just been shot through the shoulder and said, I'm hit, Lieutenant. A major battle with the enemy was just what the military brass had been hoping for. Only, it was not going according to plan. At 10 in the morning, Lieutenant Gwynn was fighting for his life. Our first platoon was overrun. Our second platoon was pinned down by mortar fire. I saw about 40 North Vietnamese soldiers coming across the landing zone at us. And all I did was say, here they come, and start shooting at them. 1 p.m., the American commander sent out an emergency signal, broken arrow, U.S. troops in danger of being overrun. Every available aircraft was called in against the North Vietnamese positions. including the giant B-52 bombers. The B-52 is uh, terrible, terrible in many ways, because firstly, there was no way you can fight back it. You can't run. There's no time for you to run. So you just lay there, waited for the death to come and, and grip you. Thousands of men died in those desperate hours. By the time the battle was over, 3,500 North Vietnamese and 305 Americans had been killed. It was obvious to the men in the field what lay ahead. Preoccupied as he was with the growing war in Vietnam, President Johnson knew that he had to address problems at home. Despite America's prosperity, 40 million citizens still live below the poverty line. And this administration today, here and now, declares unconditional war on poverty in America. In May 1964, the president unveiled the grand plan for what he called the Great Society. Mr. Johnson hoped to match the power and vitality of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal with a list of welfare, job, and educational opportunities to aid underprivileged Americans. But the privilege that many Southern blacks most desired was the right to vote, still often denied them. In Selma, Alabama, 97% of 15,000 eligible black voters were unregistered. Some because of cynicism or apathy, but most because they faced violence and intimidation from local authorities. People could only attempt to register on the first and third Mondays of each month. The Board of Registrars is not in session this afternoon as you went for them. You came down to make a mockery out of Courthouse. And you had to get some white person to vouch that you were a good character. No white person in his right mind in the state of Alabama was going to vouch that a black person was a good character. If we're wrong, why don't you arrest us? We have come to register. To Selma rapidly became the new flashpoint of the civil rights movement. On March the 7th, 1965, 600 civil rights activists planned a march that was to take them from Selma to the state capital in Montgomery, some 54 miles away. 
Their route would take the non-violent demonstrators through what amounted to enemy territory, roads and highways controlled by the Alabama State Police. And they came toward us, beating up with knife sticks, with bull whips, and tramping us with horses. I was hit in the head and just left lying there. And I, I felt like I was, I felt like it was the last protest. The violence and brutality which ended this march quickly provoked plans for a much larger one, now joined by Dr. Martin Luther King. We've gone too far now to turn back. Dr. King was determined to focus national attention on Selma, sense. and he enlisted the help of supporters from New York to Hollywood. The Reverend said, the white man can't cool it because he's never dug it. Marlon Brando was the one that got me involved in civil rights, honestly. He, uh, uh, I was walking down the street and he just pulled up in the car and he said, uh, how'd you like to go down to Selma? Yeah? I said, Selma? Selma, we're going to have a march from Selma to Montgomery. You want to come? And I said, sure. Before the second march had even begun, the Reverend James Reeb, a civil rights sympathizer, was beaten to death by a white mob. But rather than intimidating the marchers, that violence seemed to give them a powerful ally. That night, I was with Martin Luther King Jr. in Selma when we heard Lyndon Johnson. We watched him make one of the greatest speeches any American president ever made on the whole question of civil rights. Their cause must be our cause too. It's all of us who must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice. And we shall overcome. Just think of a president with a Southern accent from Texas saying to the Congress of the United States, we shall overcome. Finally, popular protest and public power had come together. And Dr. King literally started crying. Tears came down his face. I knew then that we would make it from Selma to Montgomery. On March 21st, 1965, 3,200 people set out from Selma. Four days later, as the march approached Montgomery, there were 25,000 people marching. It was an amazing moment. It was, it was scary. It was scary. There were helicopters everywhere, like uh, some sort of angry bugs. And there were only Confederate flags flying, and we were the only ones with American flags. Yeah, and Martin Luther King gave a great speech. All the world today knows that we are here and we are standing before the forces of power in the state of Alabama saying we ain't going to let nobody turn us around. That's That's right. Right. That's right. That's right. There's very few times in your life that you know that you're at some place that you're at a moment where this is one of those things that as long as there's time is going to be this moment. That was it. United States of America. On August the 6th, Lyndon Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act, finally guaranteeing black Americans the right to vote. But just as it reached a high point, the civil rights movement seemed to split into warring factions. A revolution of rising expectations stirs people to believe that the promised land is there. It was when change was coming, when there was a sense of possibility, uh, that everything broke loose and went wild. You are better than the white man. You are better than the white man. And that's not saying anything. Despite the gains of recent years, it seemed to many blacks that the pace of change was too slow, that Martin Luther King was too accommodating. These blacks began to adopt the separatist rhetoric of the charismatic Malcolm X. I used to hear Malcolm say, if a man slaps me in the face, I'm not turning my cheek. If I slap him back, he won't slap me again. That made a lot of sense. Malcolm at that time said clearly, all right, what we need is power. 
while King would say what we need is morality to help uh, bring out uh, Malcolm say forget about them just get guns and that's how they're gonna regulate the problem the contradiction however was that Martin Luther King was involved in action confronting the enemy Malcolm X was not so what you had to do was take the confrontation of King and match it as best you can with the philosophy of Malcolm X which is precisely what uh, we did we want black power we want black power the response was overwhelming In 1966, militants in Oakland, California, founded the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense and told America that the fight for civil rights would never be the same. If you come down here jumping on us and beating us up like you were beating up the peaceful protesters with your dogs, your cattle prowls, and are shooting them and are murdering these peaceful protesters, we're not going to take it. When you start shooting, we're shooting back. The call by militant leaders for total revolution received a sympathetic ear in many of the nation's impoverished inner cities, where the great society was still nowhere to be seen. Well, in the South, where we had a powerful nonviolent movement, people had a way to channel that frustration. In, in many parts of America, especially outside of the South, the fires of frustration, the fires of discontent, were beginning to burn. In 1967, that anger and discontent exploded into violence. In Newark, New Jersey, Detroit, Michigan, and more than 100 other cities, 80 people died in urban riots that summer. Lyndon Johnson was shocked, I think, at the riots and angry. He took it personally and he got angry at blacks for being ungrateful for how these great laws had been passed. Despite his disappointment, Lyndon Johnson believed that his war on poverty could still succeed. All he needed was more money. Well, the president said to me, you know, we have this uh, war going on now in Vietnam. It's going to take up all of the extra money we have right now uh, to fight that war. But he said, Sarge, look, we're going to be out of that war. We'll, that'll be finished in the next 12 to 18 months. As soon as that's finished, I will take the money we are now are devoting to the war in Vietnam, and we'll put it into the war against poverty. Obviously, that never happened. In 1964, a British rock band showed up in the United States that was described by one historian as raunchier and more rebellious than the Beatles. They were called the Rolling Stones. And in the mid-1960s, they created a song that became an anthem. I had one of the first uh, early Norelco sort of cassette players in 1964, five, and I put it next to the bed and I, with the guitar and I crashed out. And when I woke up in the morning, I noticed that the tape had gone to the end, and I'd put it in at the beginning, you know, and I ran it back, pushed play, and somewhere in the middle of the night, I had woken up and played da 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 I can't get no satisfaction. And it's there, the verse and the chorus are there, and then it stops, and the rest of the tape is me snoring. You know? <laughs> Rock music had accompanied America's youth on its journey to the forefront of the nation's consciousness with songs like Satisfaction, number one on the charts in 1965. The journey took quite a radical turn. The message is the ordinary order of things is either broken or corrupt I can't get no satisfaction. You know, do something wilder. That's how you'll get your satisfaction. The message, in a sense, is cut loose. It was music that gave us, as an entity, as a community, a sense of, of, of cohesion and a sense of existing, a real sense of being more than a few demonstrations. 
The Rolling Stones, Janis Joplin, The Doors, Bob Dylan, all of them sang in a way that invited challenge to the establishment. I think people were absolutely waking up, but they didn't know exactly how to get out of bed yet and what to do when they put their feet on the floor. We began to look around for things to do which would alert people to other possibilities, other ways of living. For some, other possibilities meant completely rejecting the values that had united their parents' generation. I mean, where is it written in stone that people have to work from nine to five? The Haight-Ashbury section of San Francisco became the center of the counterculture. Suddenly, there was uh, an environment where your personal history did not matter. Nobody cared who your parents were, whether you were rich, whether you were poor. You'd get up every day, and you had no idea what the day would bring. There were the greatest looking women parading up and down the street. There was a sense of adventure, random combinations. You could catch a woman's eye and offer her your arm and without a word walk away and spend an afternoon making love and if you didn't talk, that was okay. I was looking for a new way to express myself. You know, and I think everybody was. And unfortunately, a lot of people uh, went to drugs because it came naturally out of it came naturally out of what we were doing at the time. It's a food for the soul. Right now, I'm on LSD. Right now, every color is going through my mind. The psychedelic drug LSD became a rite of passage for many in the counterculture. These were awfully hard on, on people who were in their 40s at that time. Just awfully hard with the hair and the drugs and the music and the dirty clothes and the foul language that all became au courant, regardless of a political position one took. Brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, if you truly care about your Despised by many people in the older generation, the social ferment of the 1960s would nonetheless change forever the way young Americans looked at themselves. A long dormant struggle for equality was revived by the new freedom that many young women were feeling. Women were given more choice with the introduction of the birth control pill. We could now control when and if we chose to have children. And it helped to propel, I think, the development of a women's movement. In the 1960s, discrimination against women was solidly entrenched, particularly in the workplace. Job ads were divided into sections marked male and female. Airline stewardesses were simply dismissed on their 32nd birthday. But the great majority of American women are not participating in terms of their full potential and ability. In 1966, a group of feminists, most notably Betty Friedan, founded the National Organization for Women. This was a turning point in the women's liberation movement that was typical of many struggles at the time. Thus began another era of militancy. Women have been particularly oppressed, and now women are on the move, and there ain't going to be no stopping us. This one was, was my struggle, in which I was the actor. The Miss America stands 5 feet 7, weighs 125 pounds, and measures 36, 24 and a half, 36. On September the 7th, 1968, the new Miss America was crowned in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Outside, 200 women demonstrated against the pageant. They threw their bras and their high heel shoes, which they called instruments of oppression, into so-called freedom trash cans. We had learned that from the civil rights movement. You demonstrate, you stand up, you get in their face, and you get behind the scenes, and you pass your legislation. We learned. We were political. Take the point. For American soldiers in the field, it was grinding and bloody. But by mid-1966, the Vietnam War was settling into just the kind of conflict 
that General William Westmoreland believed America would win, a war of attrition. What General Westmoreland didn't recognize was that the North Vietnamese also saw a war they could win, as long as they didn't meet the Americans head on. The booby trap, the landmine, the raid, the ambush. Any square yard of Vietnam could be this absolutely, utterly peaceful place one second. And the next second, it was, it was the end of the world. We are not fighting a conventional war. We would go in a kind of surprise attack and then withdraw immediately. Very effective. As the U.S. grew frustrated by its inability to score decisive victories against the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong, the administration continued to pour more men and more machinery into Vietnam. By mid-1967, close to half a million Americans were involved in the fight. In the face of these escalations, the North Vietnamese continually adapted their strategies. The only option they never discussed among themselves was surrender. As long as a live Vietnamese there, the resistance would go on. We just wouldn't accept a two Vietnam. Sergeant Fowler said rice is wet, spread it out on the ground, otherwise burn it. For American troops, most of whom left Vietnam after one year of duty, things were not quite as clear at all. Almost anyone was a potential enemy as the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong enjoyed widespread sympathy in South Vietnam. In such an atmosphere of confusion, areas were conquered and then abandoned, villages saved and then destroyed. I believe I'm correct in saying that in the past four and a half years, the Viet Cong, the communists, have lost 89,000 men killed. Many Americans were dying too without ever understanding what they'd been fighting for. There was one kid who was grievously injured, and I, I had my arms around him uh, trying to, to, to comfort him, but he was losing consciousness, and he just kept staring up with an expression on his face of, uh, why, why, what's happening to me, what's happening to me? By then, 1967 and 68, when we were losing hundreds a week in that same fashion, you had to start questioning how much longer could this go on. On January the 20th, 1968, U.S. Marines got involved in a battle with the North Vietnamese near the American base at Khe Son. It was the beginning of a critical campaign. For several weeks, the North Vietnamese hammered Khe Son and its defenders. We were moving our way up the trench line, and it came to a machine gun book, and there was, someone was firing a machine gun. And I said, where's everybody else? And he said, there isn't anybody else. And I said, where's your crew? And he said, they're gone. The siege continued throughout February and into March. home, television viewers were shocked by the spectacle. Jack Bronson was a medic. They screamed for me. They screamed for their mothers. It is not like the movies. You are looking at this person who is begging not to die. And the first question they always would ask me, am I going to make it back? and I had a lie a lot of times. When I was hit, I knew I was hurt bad. And I can remember laying there, and I could hear the Vietnamese, because they were throw kept throwing grenades in. I could hear them talking. And I can remember saying to myself, you were going to die. I got this telegram telling me that he was very seriously hurt, and that the prognosis 
was not good. He was so far away that if I could only see him, it wouldn't be so bad. But he's way out there, didn't know whether I loved him or if I could only hold his hand or something. Because I didn't, think, I didn't expect to see him again. Severely wounded, Jack Bronson would return home to a country unsure what to make of his sacrifice. In late March, the North Vietnamese simply melted away, and Khe Son became another in a growing tally of dubious victories, a base desperately fought over and then abandoned. Yeah, I, I don't know. They, they say we're fighting for something. I don't know. By now, many Americans on the home front didn't see the Vietnam War as one of national survival. Opposition to the high price being paid in American servicemen began to build. As we began to see what was happening in that war, watching on television, it was stunning. You know, it was something that we had never seen. We'd never seen that face of war. You know, it was always World War II, uh, the good war. And nobody ever saw the Korean War. I mean, how many pictures have you ever seen of the Korean War? But suddenly, there it was, 6 o'clock. You know, there were bodies and, and firefights. What made the, the experiences of the Vietnam War generation so different from those of the World War II? Their parents hadn't had TV when they were kids. That made them different from every generation that had gone before. The anti-war demonstrators in the United States now took their protests to a new level. Stu Ewan took part in one of the growing number of demonstrations against the war. The confrontation was very intense. The cops, very suddenly, had moved in on people and started to crack heads. And they beat people pretty, pretty badly. There was a lot of blood. Uh, there were a lot of injuries. And all of a sudden, people understood themselves as being uh, at odds with the powers that be. That, for us, was a signal that we needed to come back strong become more militant. In trying to stop the war in Vietnam, the demonstrations intensified the war at home. Burn the Burn the don't have to go. say no. There was a, a class a dimension to the Vietnam protests. To a large extent, it was college kids saying they didn't want to go fight this war, that they didn't see much point in. So the blue-collar kids did. It was one of the uglier things about the Vietnam War that to what extent it was fought by the, the less fortunate uh, in the society. In February and March 1968, television brought another set of horrifying images home to Americans. U.S. soldiers were fighting for their lives from one end of South Vietnam to the other. The U.S. Embassy in Saigon was being overrun. This was the Tet Offensive, a military defeat for the North Vietnamese, but ultimately a political victory. Despite hearing repeatedly that there was light at the end of the tunnel, most Americans came to realize they were not going to win the war in Vietnam anytime soon, if ever. On March the 31st, 1968, with the presidential election just a few months away, an exhausted Lyndon Johnson seemed to come to the same conclusion. I shall not seek, and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. And I looked at the guys in the bunker with me, and I thought, I said, he's getting out. And the other guy said, what do you mean? I said, he's not going to run for president. He's not running anymore. He's getting out, he's the commander in chief. And so if he's getting out, what are we doing here? In America, 1968, peace and understanding were fast becoming distant memories. As the Vietnam War became the longest war in American history. Over a hundred college campuses were racked by furious protest. 
In the spring, many of the nation's cities exploded once again with racial violence, propelled by the terrible events of April the 4th, 1968. When I heard over the news that Martin Luther King had been shot in Memphis and then seconds later killed in Memphis, it was as if a member of my family had been killed. And it said to me, here's this guy has been going around preaching peace and nonviolence and peaceful resistance, and now someone has shot him dead. And it shattered my belief that we could work these things out in a peaceful way. It's perhaps well to ask what kind of a nation we are and what direction we want to move in. That night, Robert Kennedy, the leading candidate for the Democratic presidential nomination, announced King's death to a room full of campaign workers. In Kennedy, many Americans, both black and white, saw a man who could turn back the tide of violence. Two months after the death of Martin Luther King, Robert Kennedy was killed. My wife came into the bedroom and said, you know, you know what, the, what they've done now? They shot Bobby Kennedy. This day, a sort of paranoid moment of our own, but uh, the sense of, of the, everything coming undone. And you never quite get over it. You no longer feel safe in your life the way you did as a child when your parents were alive. In those turbulent days, um, you felt you never really will be safe. In late August, the city of Chicago was the host city for the Democratic National Convention. Will the convention be, will the sergeant at arms enforce order in the convention? Delegates from all 50 states arrived to find Chicago an armed camp. The city's mayor, Richard Daley, knew that tens of thousands of young demonstrators were also on their way. They were determined to have their say. All across the country, the, the new left was trying to provoke people into actions that would escalate the whole thing. I, you never saw people so provoked in all your life as those Chicago police. The things those kids said to them. I take one look at these pigs out here, and I know what America's about. The gestures they made to them, deliberately designed to bring on this reaction. I volunteered to go to the Democratic Convention because I wanted to see it. I can remember up at uh, 2 in the morning trying to get to sleep. It was a little difficult because uh, our windows were open, it was very hot, and all we could hear was the chant, F.U. Dale Lee. It was quite an event. The Democratic Party was coming apart right there in the streets of Chicago. It seemed to many the country itself was coming apart. In November, America elected a new president who promised to heal the nation's wounds. Richard Milhouse Nixon. We're going to suck it to him from now. Just as American unity and confidence seem to be crumbling, a man from Ohio lands on the moon. We'll see that on the next episode of The Century, America's Time. Thank you for joining us. I'm Peter Jennings.